Hey, um, hey everyone, welcome to the data learning seminars. Today we have Catalia Gangea from DeepMind. She did her PhD with Pietro Liu and the University of Cambridge. And now she works as a research scientist in DeepMind and she'll be talking about, about the Perceiver AR and application for music generation. I'll leave the audience with you, Catalina, and thank you for your presentation. Yeah, thanks very much, Cesar. Um, well, welcome everyone and thanks for, thanks for attending my talk really. I was telling Cesar and the others that this is the first time in, in a long time that I've, I'm giving a talk, uh, well, externally outside, outside my workplace. But um, anyway, this is very exciting for me because I can talk to you about a work that's very dear to me. Um, it's about Perceiver AR, AR standing for other aggressive. And um, well, this, this kind of architecture that we developed recently is, um, is applicable to many domains, but today I'll mostly focus on uh, applying this model in the music domain, so on music generation. Uh, and the title of my talk is Autoregressive Long Context Music Generation uh, with Perceiver AR. And hopefully in, in my talk, I'll make it clear why uh, the long context part is, is essential for, for this kind of task and for others that are related. So, okay, first of all, great shout to my collaborators. Um, Perceiver Air was my first project at DeepMind as a full-time um, uh, employee. And um, I, I've had a lot of fun learning about perceivers, but also working with a lot of different people. And yeah, it's, it's such a great experience. Um, and yeah, these are, these are uh, both from, from DeepMind and Google Brain, my collaborators. So it was a really nice, uh, really nice collaboration. So first of all, um, to touch upon the long context part of, uh, of, this, of this work and in general in, in multimodal learning and in, in generation tasks, why do we need to take long context into account and think about this? So I guess for, for machine learning models and for generative architectures, but not only whatever tasks you may wanna solve Ideally, the model that you apply to the task uh, is general and transferable across tasks and domains. Um, so eventually you end up having any kinds of inputs and any kinds of outputs. So your outputs may be class labels, but going beyond that, you may end up generating entire modalities or um, a combination of these even. So I'm sure you've all kind of seen the recent landscape where there is a lot of text to image, but there's also some text to video recently and things are getting pretty exciting and large scale. Um, so I, I guess more, more recently, there's been a trend towards general purpose architectures, especially with kind of the, uh, the entire work on transformers and um, people finding out that these are very general architectures that can work well across a multitude of tasks. So, I guess in the end, the ideal situation is to have a single model that can perform any task given any set of inputs from any kinds of domains, so any modal inputs. Um, and in, in designing these kinds of architectures, it's, it's great to avoid any domain specific assumptions so that obviously you can process whatever data comes in. Um, but I'm aware that it's not entirely possible to, to do this in, um, in domains that actually need domain knowledge. Um, so some, some obstacles or hurdles in, um, in the recent literature, I guess, and with existing models, some of them. So a lot of the architectures, for example, when they have, when they take inputs, they first kind of apply this specific pre-processing that's specific to any modality. So for example, for images, you may take patches from them. You may pass them through some convolutional layers. Um, for audio, the same. You may extract some patches um, and so on. And then another thing to consider is the input size itself, which can be prohibitive for a lot of the architectures that are out there. Um, if you think about an image input, a single image, this has n by n by three tokens, so three for each of the RGB channels, for example, but then n by n for a square image of a size n, right? So when n is 64, which isn't really a high-res image to begin with, um, you end up with 12,000 tokens already. So this is quite a big input. Um, and then obviously passing this kind of thing through a transformer 
is going to bring up a lot of issues. Um, so then when you think about inputs that are much longer than this, like books or music albums or even films, video, videos that span entire films, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really challenging to simply throw them into a model because of their size. So yeah, um, as I was saying, some of the current architectures, um, a lot of the things that are out there are based on vanilla transformers. So uh, these scale poorly with the size of the input. Um, and then others are, the processing is preceded by some strategies that either lose the information, if you like down sample an image, say, um, or that require some domain specific tricks. So in general, we would like to avoid these, um, these issues. And yeah, the main question remains, how do we scale up to a really large context? And I guess um, a point about context, why is context important? Well, um, it simply tells you, you know, more information about the things you're supposed to predict. So I guess in, in a book, if you want to generate the ending of a book, you don't want to you don't only want to um, process or attend to the previous chapter, but ideally you would find out more about the characters and about the interactions between them. So you'd like the whole the whole book ideally, right? And this can end up being, um, well, tens of thousands of tokens or, or even more than that for longer books. Just an example. For videos, obviously things are even more complicated than that. So um, a recent class of architectures, of models that has been developed by um, some of my colleagues here is called perceivers. Um, and this is what the initial architecture looks like. So just as a, a high level description, you, um, you have an input here, which here it's, it's called a byte array. So anything in there. And then um, you have a latent array that is initialized um, in, in some form. And then as a first step in the architecture, you, you perform a cross attention between your input and the latent array. And then there is further processing that happens in the latent space. So through self attention between the latent array so that you refine the representation between these latents. And then you can optionally add one or more steps of cross attention at intermediate points in, in the stack. And then at the end, you have this final representation. And then um, I guess this is this is a classification task illustrated in the image. This is what the initial architecture was evaluated on. And um, the main point here is that instead of having to model um, the whole kind of processing on, on, on your input of, of a very big size, what you do instead is you take a much smaller size here in the latent array, you perform this cross attention, and then subsequently the self attention is only performed on the latent array, which has a much smaller size. So uh, to give a concrete example, if you think about an input, that's an image, as I was saying, of size 12,000 tokens, your latent array can be initialized to something much smaller, like 1,024 tokens. And then your n squared computation is going to actually be feasible and you can stack more layers as we like to do um, so that you can get a more refined representation that is a stronger one useful for your downstream tasks. So this is the idea behind perceivers. Um, so yeah, the main points, you decouple the input size from the model depth. Um, you remove the need for the quadratic um, interactions in, in throughout the D self attention layers of a typical transformer. Instead, what you do is you add a finite number of cross attend operations. Um, it's typically even one cross attend between your input and the array of latents of size M, which is much smaller than your input size. So the resulting complexity uh, is quadratic, but now it's quadratic in the size of the latents instead of the size of the input. So that's the gist of it. Now, um, there's there's been multiple flavors of perceivers developed, perceiver AR being one of them, but um, others include perceiver IO, which um, 
on top of perceiver, it adds this uh, decoding step and you can specify a query of, of the shape that you want. Um, and this query represents what you want at the output of the model. So now uh, the processing happens in the same manner. So you still have an input array, you still have a latent array, you still perform a cross attention between them. And then you still get a latent representation that you then process in the self attention stack. But now uh, once you have these latents processed and refined, you also pass in this output query array to the decoder. Uh, and there is a further cross attend happening here. And then you essentially produce uh, predictions in your output array. So an example of a task that you can, you can think of solving is when your input array is an image and your output array, output query array is um, a segmentation map. So for example, you want to classify every point in that image and um, you can think of doing it this way. Uh, and this is a picture showing all of the tasks that Perceiver IO was, uh, was trained and evaluated on. So you've got mass language modeling, uh, StarCraft II classification, multitask classification, optical flow, and multimodal autoencoding. So here for each of these, you can see exactly how many queries are passed. So this is the output query array, and this is like its dimensionality here. So I guess for language modeling, you want to predict 2048 tokens. Um, uh, what else do we have? Some interesting ones include video queries, which actually decode a massive amount of positions, and optical flow. And here, I think this is the dimensionality of an image, essentially. So yeah, just some examples of tasks that you can solve with this kind of architecture once you decouple the input size from the processing depth to get really good representations. And finally, another flavor of the perceiver is the hierarchical perceiver that further scales this architecture to even larger inputs, um, some of which are 500,000 tokens by grouping the input into uh, several chunks and applying the same strategy for each of the groups and then merging these at the end. Okay, and now um, for the purpose of this talk and this work, we thought about how to add AR other regressive capabilities to the perceiver architecture. And um, to be fair, this is it, it looks fairly fairly straightforward. And I think it's it's very it's a very natural extension. And I like thinking about this. So um, I'm gonna walk you through the steps of the architecture. So first of all, um, I'm gonna take this diagram and walk through it piece by piece. So if you, so here the, the task is essentially to take an input and then predict the next tokens in the input. So this is kind of, again, you can apply this to mass language modeling, but also other tasks like, um, well, audio generation, but even image generation. So first of all, if you look at this example here, you have um, this input perceiver AR and this input is first mapped to that fixed size latent array as in the original architecture via a cross attention operation. So you take the inputs, you perform a cross attention, you get the latents. And then the latents subsequently get refined in this self attention stack. And then uh, each latent is used to produce a prediction for the targets. So here you notice that um, the targets are the shifted inputs essentially. So um, the most recent inputs correspond to the queries in this case. So small r and big A and big R are the actual queries for the architecture. And then for each of the query, you will get um, a prediction. So here you essentially predict the next token in the sequence. So here, uh, big A comes after small r, big R comes after big, big A, and then the end of sequence is the last token. So that comes after big R. Um, and then yes, each latent corresponds to a different target position, as I was saying. Okay, now, um, how to uh, make this architecture autoregressive? So this, this, this initial uh, description is very similar to the perceiver IO one, where you have a query and you decode it into the targets that you want to predict. But then 
you also need to make sure that you maintain the other aggressive objective uh, in this architecture so that, uh, for example, um, when you decode the next token for uh, big A here, you want to only attend to the previous tokens in your input and not to the big R, for example. So if you just did all pairs self-attention or all pairs cross-attention, you would end up also attending to big R. And you don't want that because in other aggression, you can't see the future, essentially. So for causal masking, um, what we did is that we only allowed each latent to attend to itself and then to attend to uh, latents corresponding to earlier information, right? So um, here in the, in the self-attention mask, you can see that uh, this first latent can only attend to itself, the second latent can attend to itself and the first latent, and similarly for the third latent. And the cross-attention mask is very similar in that um, the, the first element of the query can attend to um, all previous tokens in the input. So for small r, you can attend to the whole perceiver input. For big A, perceiver A, and for big R, perceiver AR, so the whole thing. Uh, and this is how you enforce the other aggressive objective and make sure that you don't attend to the future. Um, so that's that's pretty much um, that's pretty much it. So again, just a summary of, of what's going on here. We managed to get other aggressive generation with perceivers uh, by applying causal masking for both kinds of attention operations in the architecture. So for the initial cross attend and for the subsequent self attention operations. And here, um, if, if you remember the, the initial architecture, uh, the perceiver IO, it had an encoder and a decoder. And here, essentially, we start decoding right after we get the initial latents from this cross attention operation, which is why we call it a zero layer encoder. Um, so yeah, essentially what this does is that it compresses the input to a much smaller latent space so that we can process it in the self attention stack. And then here, um, the way our query is initialized, it's with the most recent inputs. So, um, here we have the number of latents equal to three. So we take the most three recent inputs and initialize the query with these inputs. And then these inputs are processed by the self-attention operations to predict the next corresponding tokens in the sequence. Um, so yeah, we trained this architecture with teacher forcing and um, yeah, essentially it works. So the first thing we did was we tested um, whether perceiver AR is able to uh, essentially use the entire context that, that it's given or all of the inputs that it's given for, for an example. So here we train the model on a copy task, which means that um, we gave the model an initial uh, sequence of two to, two to the 16 random bytes. And then we asked the model to copy the bytes, but in reverse order. So mirrored, we have mirror targets. So here, um, if, if you think about what the maximum distance that the model needs to actually attend to, so the, the, most, the rightmost and the leftmost token in the sequence are obviously the first and the last one. And the, the distance is 131K more or less. So that's your whole context. Um, and we found that uh, only six layer perceiver AR with 1024 latents can copy inputs perfectly in reverse order within uh, relatively few training steps of so 25,000. We also noticed that uh, in comparison with other architectures, we are able to scale perceiver AR much further um, and uh, to, to much, much longer, much longer context with faster training time. So here um, we measured what happens at uh, different context lengths. So anywhere between 1,024 and 60, 65,000. Uh, and on the y-axis, you can see the training steps per second. So like the, the compute needed to train these models. So um, first of all, the vanilla transformer uh, goes out of memory as expected pretty quickly at 2048 tokens. 
than the transformer Excel, which uses some, some other memory tricks, uh, gets a bit further at 8,192 context length. Um, but note also that you can have progressively smaller depths at bigger context lengths uh, for all models, but specifically for, for these two, right? So um, here, the biggest transformer, um, the biggest context transformer Excel only has six layers. So um, yeah, I, I guess the representations you get from that are not um, as, as useful as if you had way more, way more depth in your model. So for perceiver AR, things, things are quite different. Um, you managed to scale this to very large contexts. So basically for a transformer and TXL, you go out of memory after this, um, after this point, but then, uh, with perceiver AR, we, we were able to scale quite far. So for, for a 65K context, we can still train with a um, decent amount of layers, 18 layers here, uh, and still be quicker than uh, these two models here. So yeah, um, we, we managed to scale to much larger inputs and also train faster at the same time. So now, um, getting to the gist of it, uh, I'm going to speak about modeling music with Perceiver AR. So, Perhaps a bit of motivation about why music is, is a good domain for, uh, for training and uh, you know, applying this architecture to, to it is that music is, is very structured. So even if it's like a, a sequence of notes or whatever you want to call it, it actually exhibits a lot of structure at multiple scales, which obviously give rise to some dependencies. Um, so for example, in, in short term, you have um, you have these these building blocks, right, for music. So there's uh, there's there's chords, there's arpeggios, there's certain motifs. Um, arpeggios are pretty specific to um, a single instrument, I guess, like piano. But um, chords and motifs are things that appear in any kind of music. So pop music, rock music, whatever you want. So these uh, these short term um, characteristics span perhaps a few seconds in the case of arpeggios, but also they, they still reappear across an entire piece in similar forms, which brings me to the long-term dependencies that, that arise in music. So you can think about the overall piece structure, a very popular one in classical music is the ternary form or the ABA form where um, A means there's a, there's a theme that's being presented then B means uh, the theme is being developed and perhaps ends up sounding differently across time uh, with, with different sorts of um, buildups being explored. And then there's uh, the initial theme that gets revisited at the end of the piece. And then there's also the idea of overall coherence of the piece. So in general, well, in most cases, uh, a lot of the pieces end up being in the same key so you don't want the, these models to kind of lose track of that. Uh, and then pieces can have certain moods that are kind of descriptive of the entire duration. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there is essentially a lot of reasons why this is an ideal domain for, for generation and specifically long context generation. Uh, since, you know, if, if you're looking at a piece structure, you want this A to be generated with having this A in mind and these two A's maybe, you know, minutes apart, say, in a classical piece. So this is overall a very interesting and relevant domain. So um, in the context of the work on Perceiver AR, um, we were talking about how, how big the context was and how we were able to scale up. So with these, um, with the models trained on music, we were able to scale up to 65K for symbolic music and for raw audio uh, to 32K. And then um, for the, the number of query positions, most models we had used 1,024 and some also had 2048. Um, a bit about the data that we, we trained on um, in the music domain. So 
we looked up two data sets. First of all, there is Maestro. That is a data set that's um, open source kindly by, by, uh, by Magenta. And um, it contains um, recordings of piano performances from piano contests. So first of all, it's about 200 hours of, of music. Um, some, some notes about the domain itself. The musical domain here is sort of complex um, because it, it includes you know, classical compositions spanning uh, almost four centuries. And then if you think about the, the people who actually produced this music uh, that's, that was recorded in the competitions, their expertise is, is, pretty, is pretty solid. They're all piano contestants, so um, their skills are very good. And uh, this, this results in a very complex domain overall. And then the other data set we, we had was a piano transcription data set that had 10,000 hours music. So uh, essentially 50 times bigger than Maestro, which ended up being very important while, while training the models. Um, the music domain here, unlike Maestro, it has varied complexity. So these, um, these samples included classical pop songs, quite a few covers of piano. So uh, the domain is, is different in that sense. And then the player expertise is also different in the sense that, again, levels are mixed compared to only piano competition level players. So these are the two domains we worked on uh, for music. And now um, I'm going to talk about each of the ways to generate music, first of all. Um, the symbolic generation, and then the raw audio generation. So for symbolic, you have to essentially um, tokenize the music um, into a discrete representation, which is very similar to the way you tokenize language, right, for a language model. So it's, it's, the, same, um, it's the same idea. So to tokenize MIDI files, because this is what, what we had, for symbolic music, we use the scheme that uh, Anna Huang et, et al. used in the music transformer paper, which is described um, extensively in, um, in their paper. But the gist of it is that you have a, an event-based representation of, of the music, which for piano refers to when a key is pressed or depressed, uh, the duration that the key is pressed for, the velocity that the key is pressed with, and then uh, for each note, you obviously have, have a different pitch. So this is a kind of a graphical description of, of the tokenization scheme. So um, yeah, this essentially allows you to, to encode music in a, in a discrete manner and um, have a sequential representation of, of what's happening in a piece. So, okay, we have two data sets. First of all, I'm going to talk about the piano transcription data set. So here, the model had a 65K um, input size. The depth of the model was 24, and we had 1,024 latents or query positions. And then for results, um, the negative log likelihood was 1.18. But here we, we can't really compare against anything else because this is this was an internal data set. It's updated regularly, so we couldn't even compare against our own our own results, let alone um, other ones. But I will play some samples and um, show essentially what what it sounds like. And for Maestro, our model had uh, 4,096 input tokens, 12 sample attention layers, and 2048 latents. This was our best performing model on Maestro. And here we were actually able to compare against previous results. So the music transformer was the previous state of the art here. And then we managed to, uh, to surpass that. Um, and then, yeah, they, they, they essentially evaluated on a previous version of Maestro. And we also provide numbers for the most recent version of the data set. Um, and then for raw audio generation, um, the encoding scheme is a bit different. So the general issue with, with audio is that it's, it's very high dimensional. So um, a second of audio 
in our case is 16,000 points. So for example, if you want to model like 30 seconds, you're already at a lot of inputs. So um, a nice way to get around this is to use the vector quantized embeddings from neural codex. And um, we were able to extract these from a, from a sound stream neural codec at three different bit rates. So from 20, uh, from, from 12 to 22 kilobytes per second. And the resulting number of tokens for a second of audio were 1200, 1800, and 2200, which is quite the down sample from 16K points. Um, and then as a, as a discussion about the, the relative bit rates, so we explored three of them. Um, and obviously, uh, when you increase the bit rate, the, the, the quality and fidelity of the sound is, is much better. But then what happens at a lower bit rate? Um, you have a coarser structure. So one second of audio is only 1,200 tokens, which allows you to train on a longer time window. And then uh, conversely, the, the fidelity of the audio is, is lower. And you'll be able to also hear that in, in the samples that I'm going to play. And there's way more samples uh, on the website, which I'll give the link for at the end. So you'll be able to listen to, um, to them in your own time. So yeah, essentially here, um, this is an example of, of us training models on the three different bit rates. So for, um, for the highest bit rate, we were able to get 29 seconds of generated audio. I think this was with a 65K uh, input size model. Uh, and you can notice that at 12 kilobytes per second, we can get almost a whole minute of audio. Okay, um, and then here we we uh, we train and evaluated on on the Maestro data set. So our model had a 65k input token size, um, 12 layers, and again 1,024 query positions. And these are the the results in negative load likelihood we got on both uh, validation and test splits. And this is the, the amount of context that the model gets essentially. So yeah, for a 65K input size, you get 29 seconds at 22 kilobytes per second. Okay, are we at the fun part yet? Yes, we are. So for samples, um, first I'm gonna play a couple of symbolic samples from the piano transcription data set. And um, yeah, essentially I'm gonna I'm gonna let you um, make your own opinions about them and also share share mine, which are already written there. Um, but yeah, um, enjoy. I think I need to turn off my mic and
Okay, so those were samples from the piano transcription data set. Um, overall, in, in my opinion, potentially a biased one, I would listen to these anytime on the background while I'm working or even relaxing or so I, I was really happy to see what, what came out of the model essentially. Um, so yeah, again, some, some strengths I think these, uh, the model has is able to generate coherent samples from the start to end. Um, and I don't know if you looked at the duration of them, but some of them are entire several minutes long. So it's, it's quite impressive that a model is able to um, kind of keep the same overall style and you know, atmosphere of the piece across um, minutes of, of music. Um, and then there's, there's a pretty good domain modeling happening. So you notice chord progressions appearing, some arpeggios and some stylistic um, uh, characteristics. But then again, um, in terms of weaknesses, the model sometimes chooses to, to stay on the safe side and maybe perhaps be a bit too repetitive um, instead of you know, creating surprising combinations of, um, of, um, of music. And then I don't know if it's necessarily a weakness. I know some players do this anyway. There are like some small timing errors, some, some delays in pressing some of the keys. Um, but yeah, overall, um, I found these results to be, to be quite strong. And this is obviously because of the amount of data we had to train this on. So it's 10,000 hours is, is a lot of music. Um, and the domain I think is, is also, um, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of things. So it's, it's, it's quite friendly and also probably allows for a lot of generalization. Um, and then, some symbolic samples from the Maestro models. Um, let's see.
Okay, so those are two samples from a model trained on Maestro. Um, I guess the, this domain is quite different, as I was explaining before. So th there's different things to 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 notice in in these samples. I think first of all, there's a decent amount of domain modeling. So in in piano performances, especially in, in competitions, um, at the level of, of of skill that the players have, there's a lot of virtuoso style developments happening in these pieces. Um, so like fast progressions and arpeggios and key presses, um, which which is encountered in, in some of these samples. Um, the second one particularly had this kind of beautiful theme that was uh, exposed up, up to the first minute or so, and then it keeps on being developed over in more minutes, subsequent minutes. Um, it was quite repetitive at the beginning, if you noticed, but then it actually builds up towards um, something nice. So I think the whole sample is should be on the website, so you should be able to listen to it if you like. But some of the weaknesses here, um, the, the samples don't have, end up being that coherent as in the piano transcription case. So there's more amount of chaos uh, across time. Um, there's also some deviation from the original kind of progression and feel of the piece. And then there you can you can sometimes find um, silence in, in the middle of the of a generated sample. And yes, overall, I guess um, this domain is also quite complex. So you, you can sort of hear an attempt at complexity rather than melodicity in, in the pieces. Um, and now just, just to show you the, the quality of the raw audio that's generated, I'm going to play you um, only a short amount of, of samples at each of the bit rates um, that, that I was discussing. This is for a 32K input model instead. Okay, I hope that was clear enough, even over, over Zoom and uh, through this presentation. But you can definitely hear the quality, the audio quality increasing with the bit rate increasing. But also, if you noticed, these samples get progressively shorter for the same amount of inputs that you feed to the model. So for a 32K model, you get 27 seconds generated at 12 kbps. Then um, you get 18 seconds here and then uh, 14 for a 22 kilobytes per second sound stream encoded input. Um, so those were some samples from the model, um, which, which I hope you enjoyed. And again, there's, there's more to listen to if, uh, if you're interested in this. And then perhaps I can wrap this up by talking about a few future directions that are definitely worth exploring in this space. So You've noticed that for the symbolic generation, the inputs, uh, the, the model samples ended up being a few minutes long. So um, we, we can model um, generously sized pieces, I think, in, in, that, in that symbolic domain. But in the raw audio representation, we can only model up to one minute. And even, even then, um, we are lacking the the actual domain quality and the coherence in the samples, at least relatively to, to the symbolic domain. So it, it's, it will be interesting to explore even longer sequences of raw audio. For this, uh, more data is definitely needed because Maestro uh, only has 200 hours. So in, in terms of raw audio, this didn't give us a, a, lot, of, a lot of data. Now, um, Another point, uh, these are all samples that were within the context length of the model. So within the number of maximum number of inputs that was passed to the model. But then uh, a nice thing is to also maintain the quality while sampling beyond the input size. 
so how, how do you maintain the coherency um, after having to discard the, the oldest inputs, essentially? And then music generative models suffer in, in the evaluation because beyond negative log likelihood, which is the standard measure that, that is used for, for these kinds of models, there is no clear quantitative way to, to evaluate the outputs. So um, there is a need for more suitable metrics for these kinds of models. So I'm, I'm saying that the, a lower number for the NLL doesn't necessarily correlate with, with better samples in the musical sense. So um, I guess a lower NLL can be achieved when you end up predicting the same thing over and over again, because it, it has a higher likelihood than other things that may not have been necessarily seen in the training data, or the model doesn't necessarily know how to kind of compose what it's learned, um, compose different pieces of, of knowledge um, about the domain. So you've seen that the model sometimes stayed on the safe side in those, um, in those samples, but then surprising developments within a piece can, can be more interesting from a musical perspective. So this, this is definitely something that, that we're lacking at the moment. Um, so with this, I think I'm gonna wrap up because um, it should be some time for questions. So thanks a lot for listening, everyone. And these are some, some links that, um, that you can access to read more about Perceiver AR, to listen to the samples, uh, look at the code. So in particular, uh, this blog post um, focuses on, on the music side of things and also links to everything else that, that we've published um, with respect to Perceiver AR. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Catalina. That was a really great presentation. We have a couple of um, questions on the yeah. chat. Um, the first one, very quickly, if it, is it possible to get a copy of the slides? Um, I think it should be fine. I, I would have to double check, but I think so. Okay, well, otherwise yeah. we, record, we have a recorded version of the talk, will be uploaded later. Uh, so Ni here says, very cool. Can you, how can you confirm that the model is generated something novel instead of recalling something from the training data set? That's a very good point. Um, we definitely uncovered Furia Lee's a couple of times, I'm not gonna lie. So it's definitely re remembering things that are potentially occurring more often than others. So I imagine there's a lot of Furia Lee's covers uploaded by people. So, you know, um, this is why this was generated. Uh, I think there's no clear way to do this. I'm thinking maybe if you upload this on YouTube, YouTube has some sort of filters that, you know, detect copyrighted music and um, don't let you upload the video. But yeah, there's there's no there's no clear way to to eliminate these samples. I think beyond that, um, yeah, it's a very good question. <laughs> Maybe you can like you know compare sequences from your training set somehow, but in when it when it's when this when the training set is um, is this big, I can definitely see problems. Perhaps you can compute embeddings instead and do some retrieval uh, on sequences of the same length, and then you can end up detecting massive similarities. Perhaps that's a way to go. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, pretty. It says. What sort of prompts or input do you provide during inference that can lead to different musical outcomes in the output stage of the model? Um, so this was a, everything that I've shown here is completely unconditional generation. So we're starting generation from the BOS token, beginning of sequence. Um, we didn't experiment with any, any sort of prompts um, in the context of, of this work. But I think conditional generation is, even more interesting to study because it opens the way to users interacting with these models. Um, so I guess prompts to do, that can lead to different outcomes. So I guess one way to, to do different outcomes is to simply change the seed because then you actually get different, different samples. This is how we got different samples from the model. So perhaps doing that for, for the same prompt will, will get you different, um, different continuations. Maybe you can also try something like beam search. Although I, I, I think there should be some level of stochasticity in there. Um, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, and Hannah says, does the model understand mel melodicity? Why does it bias towards complexity or is there any way to improve that? 
Analysticity. Um, so the model kind of learns language modeling on music tokens in the symbolic space and in the raw audio space the same, but on vector quantized embeddings from sound stream. So um, I, I don't have a clear answer for whether it understands melodicity. This is probably something that you could ask human raters, which we didn't we didn't have a human eval study uh, in our in our work. Um, I would say it it generates things that sound melodic the more data that you provide for it. So again, perhaps you notice that the, the piano transcription generations were more melodic overall than uh, the maestro ones, simply because of the, the domain and the amount of data available. So uh, the bias towards complexity, I'm thinking, um, again, it's it's a mix of the difficulty of the maestro music compared to the piano transcription music. And then um, is there any way to improve that? Well, in, in, in this, um, for this simple, simple kind of architecture, that's very like modality agnostic, domain agnostic, simply learns the auto regression and the prediction. Um, the only way to improve this is probably to get more training data, so more recordings. Um, otherwise, yeah, you would maybe have to add some some inductive biases in there. And I think in, in the music generation literature, there's a lot of work on um, you know, incorporating the structure or using sheet music or things like that. Thank you. And there's, um, sure. yep, just two more. Uh, you knew asking um, how to generate a 10,000 hour piano data set. Are they lab labeled manually or gathered by dis distributed web crawlers? Um, so this is an internal piano data set. Um, it's, I would say it's, it's automatically generated and it's not, um, this is not labeled because we, we don't use any labels for this work. We just, um, this is an autoregressive task, which means it's sort of self-supervised in the sense that you use the data to, to learn and that's it. So you don't need any labels for a, an entire sequence. You just need the next token in the sequence and so on. And we train the model by teacher forcing. And the last question is how many channels do you, are you using basically? Does the input output audio has and will the stability be affected if the input is a two channel song compared to a single channel? Um, how many channels? Um, well, I think, so, okay, for the, um, so for the symbolic music, it, it doesn't, yeah, so for the audio, um, in the, in the audio case, um, well, I would have to double check this actually for the Maestro data set, um, perhaps. Uh, we can have a look at this. So the uh, uncompressed audio is actually stereo, so it's two channel. Um, and the question was, will the stability be affected? Yeah, we haven't tried single channel, then we just used Maestro for audio. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what happens. But I don't expect anything much to change since we're using vector quantized embeddings from the audio anyway. So um yeah but but i'm really not sure about the answer can I ask a good question so like in the current uh, debate i can't hear you sorry oh there you go yeah on the current debate about like generative models like with stable diffusion and like dali yeah what, what will be like the like intellectual property of music generated in this context i i think I, that's, I think that's quite tricky. Um, um, It's, yeah, we, we probably can't release this model as it is simply because it, it uses music that was made by other people. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, um, no, just a curiosity. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I know all, all the ongoing debate about these models. Um, yeah, just yeah one... for music, it's very tricky because it also has like vocal, um, vocal data in there. So you could, think of issues like speaker identification and mm -hmm. yeah. okay but you see that we might go in, into like 
the current debate, just no images could be like music now, for example. Um, sorry, what's the actual question? No, the question is like, you see like maybe the music generation could enter the debate as well. It's not just like mm. images being here. I mean, yeah, I think, um, I think it definitely has similar similar issues that people should consider when um, when when making these models available. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you. And there's, um, yeah, maybe I'll take one more question. Um, here says like, could you use a blue metric to quantify the model performance? Um, that's probably more suited for the language space. So I'm not very familiar with language modeling myself. I haven't worked on it too much, but um, conditional generation provide a few seconds, measure the output compared to the rest of the input. Um, yeah, yeah I'm not sure how to apply it. Like word to... Overlap. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying just for context, it, it, it just measures like some word overlap and i was thinking since you're generating oh. discrete tokens um you could mm. probably use those indexes of the discrete tokens as um as like substitution oh, for words basically yeah um i haven't thought about this um but i'm not sure it applies i would have to read more about blow and um if if it encourages repetition though or it rewards that i wouldn't think that's a good approach simply because of the need to maybe not repeat um things in music too much across time but that's a yeah, very interesting I, mean, yeah, I think that same problem kind of exists in language as well um where you don't want oh, AI models to generate the same tokens um so there have been like variants of the blue metric or something along that route but the the problem seems very akin to language modeling so um yeah, okay. i was just wondering if there was something you could take from the metrics from there and apply it to this that, that's a good point thanks um i'll read about it oh, it's a super cool th talk thank you thank you yeah and thanks everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I might have to rush because I have another meeting. But... Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, thank you, Katarina, for everything. Thank you for all the questions. Like, great talk. I thanks really, so it. yeah. Thank you for okay. doing this. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.